Hi everyone, uh, today we're looking at um, completing one of the case studies from the Practical Stress Analysis with Finite Elements book. Um, so if you're not familiar with this book, um, its um, title, Practical Stress Analysis with Finite Elements, second edition, uh, the author is Brian MacDonald, the publisher is Last 7 Publishing. The ISBN details are given here. Um, the second edition was published in July 2011 and it's available from Amazon and, and all good bookshops. So what we're looking at doing today is we're looking at uh, chapter 10 of the book which presents a number of case studies um, which try and help you to understand the materials presented in the main body of the book. We're going to be looking today at case study A which is the most basic of the case studies which uses trust elements. Um, and we're going to look at trying to solve case study A using the ANSYS finite element software package. Um, so the uh, video was made by myself, Brian MacDonald from the School of Mechanical, Mechanical Engineering in Dublin City University and some other resources for the Practical Stress Analysis book can be find, found at this uh, web page here. So let's look at the specifics of, uh, of case study A then. So case study A is looking at a simple bridge structure and it's looking at modelling that bridge structure using truss elements. So remember again that truss elements um, can expand or contract but they do not model any bending behaviour so they're a very very basic type of element. Um, in particular here we're looking at two dimensional truss elements so we're going to look at one half of this bridge if you like, um, so one, one side of the bridge and here's the, the, what our model is going to essentially look like. Um, we just have to take a look at some of the information we're told about the problem. We're given the various angles in between the truss members that make up the bridge. We're given the, the various lengths of the, the members and we're also given, given the height. Um, so from between knowing the angles and knowing the heights and lengths we can calculate the length and the coordinates of all the um, points where the truss, trusses meet and join each other. Uh, we're also given the loading that's on the bridge, so we're told that the, the far left hand side of the bridge has a load of 300 kilonewtons, the far right hand side has a vertical load of 360 kilonewtons, and there's a 320 kilonewton and 350 kilonewton load at various points in the, the, center, or the center of the bridge. Um, we're also told that the left hand end side of the bridge cannot move, so it, it, it's, it's fixed in all degrees of freedom, so it can't move up and it can't move across. The right hand side of the bridge can't move up but it can move horizontally so it's free to move in the horizontal direction but cannot move vertically. So if you look through the book and read through case study A it talks about why various assumptions are made and why we make those assumptions and I've listed these assumptions here then. So the, the element type to be used is a 2D truss element. Um, so again it's the simplest type of element, it's the, the, the first type of element we generally look at and we, we work our way up from there. Material model, we're going to assume it's a linear elastic model for structural steel, so we're going to assume that that um, loading that is on the bridge does not cause any of the uh, steel that makes up the truss members um, to yield. So in other words, they stay in their elastic region. So we're told that the Young's modulus is 210 by 10 to the power 9 pascals, or 210 gigapascals. We're given Poisson's ratio at 0.27. And we're told that the yield stress of steel is 355 megapascals. We don't actually need to enter that uh, usually into our material model, but it's handy just to know that, to check against our results, to ensure that um, uh, when we get our results, we want to ensure that none of the um, members have actually exceeded the yield stress, because if that happened, our linear elastic assumption here would not be valid. The geometry for our model is essentially given to us here. Um, we may have to calculate a few things based on the angles and, and the lengths, but we can work out what all these points are quite easily using basic trigonometry. Um, the mesh then, we're going to assume that each line here or each truss uh, member is divided into one element and that should always be the case for truss elements and um, if you want to see more information on that, if you read the detail of case study A in chapter 10 or if you look at chapter 4 in the book where it talks about truss elements, it'll, it'll explain to you why that must be the case. The boundary conditions are going to be applied directly to the nodes, so the left hand end, the node at this point here and the left hand point of the bridge is going to be held in all degrees of freedom. What that means is it won't be allowed to move in either the um, horizontal direction or the vertical direction. They know that the extreme right hand end is going to be held in the vertical direction but it's going to be free to move in the horizontal direction. The loads then are going to be applied to the nodes as shown. So we're going to basically apply a 300 vertical um, low force here, a 320 kilonewton vertical force to that point, 350 kilonewton force here and a 360 uh, 
kilonewton vertical force there and you know we need to make ensure that they act in the right direction as well so if our positive um, uh, her vertical axis is actually going up the page then we may need to enter negative values to get these to go in the correct direction but we'll cover that when we look um, at how to specifically do this ANSYS. Okay so the next thing I'm going to do is um, open up ANSYS and then start uh, working our way through this problem. Okay so I've um, opened up ANSYS here and um, the first thing I want to do um, depending on what version of ANSYS you have. We may not have some of these options available but I'm going to um, click on the, the top of the main menu here in preferences and turn on structural um, because we're not going to be interested in looking at a thermal fluid or thermal or fluid elements in, in this case. So that will just turn off all the options to do with the thermal elements and fluid elements and just allow us to pick structural options and it'll make things a little bit simpler. It's not a necessity but it just makes things a little bit simpler. Okay so and as always with ANSYS the best um, uh, strategy to use is to, to work your way down the menus. Okay, so probably the first thing to do if you haven't done it already is to give your um, uh, file a file name so that you can recover it again if something was wrong. So probably always go, you know, file, uh, change job name. In this case, I've called it case study A and just maybe save that um, so that you have a saved copy in case something goes wrong. Okay, um, so the first thing we're going to do is um, open up the preprocessor and again, as I said, with ANSYS, the, the thing to do is to work your way down the menu. And if you look at um, the way the book is structured as well, you'll see that um, the choices in the book are given various chapters. So chapter four is all about element type. Uh, chapter five is about material properties. Um, and then chapter um, six, I think, is about modeling and chapter and meshing and, and so on and boundary conditions. So the book follows more or less the same procedure that we're going to go through here. Okay, so getting back to case study A then, um, or if you may remember, the first thing that we said is that we're going to use a, um, a 2D uh, truss element. So we need to find that in ANSYS. So we click on element type and we click on add, edit, edit delete and we get the um, element type dialog box comes up. And in that we're going to click on add. And here we get a list of the various um, element types available to us. So again, the book would more or less follow um, this type of structure here where the book starts off with links which are also known as trusses beam elements, pipe elements, solids, shells, and so on, and more complicated types of elements like contact down the bottom. So here we're only interested in link elements, and we're going to pick the simplest element, which is a 2D spar, so element type number one there. Um, so we go OK to that, and we see that element type number one is link one. In this case, a lot of the time we'll, actually, we'll always check the options for the element. In this case, this element doesn't have any options, so we don't need to bother with that. OK, so we just close down the element type box then. Uh, so and um, then we can also close down the element type um, submenu. Uh, the next thing we have down here is uh, real constants. It's the next uh, item down, working our way down the menu. So we need to add a real constant to that element. So what what the real constant is in this case is it defines the cross-sectional area of the element. Okay, so it's uh, you're defining some of the element properties whenever you uh, change the real constants. So in this case, we want to add a real constant for element type number one. And it asks us, what's the cross-section area for this, this element type? So if you go back to um, chapter 10 and look at the information for case study A, you will see that all of the elements have a cross-section area of 0.003 meters squared. So we're just going to enter 0 0.003 in there and click on OK. And you will see that set one, real constant set one, has been defined for element type number one. OK, so we can now close down the real constant submenu. And the next menu then is material properties. So if we go down to material models here, it'll bring us up the uh, material define material model behavior box. Uh, again, we're looking for a structural material and we're looking for a linear, elastic, and isotropic. So we're, we're talking about using an isotropic material model, so it's got the same properties in all directions. Okay, simplest type of material model. And it asks us for EX, which is Young's modulus um, in the X direction, or in all directions in this case, because we're only looking at an isotropic material. So we put in 210 e to the 9, or 210 by 10 to the power of 9 pascals. And then it asks us for Poisson's ratio. So PR stands for Poisson's ratio between the X and Y directions. Um, so again, we take the value from the case study, um, from the book, um, around page 300. So it's a 0.27. Let me click on OK. So material model number one is defined as a linear isotropic material model for structural steel. 
so we can close down the material properties submenu now. Sections, we don't need that. If we um, had a beam uh, element or if we had a shell element, we may need to go in there and, and change the section type. So we can go straight on to modeling. We want to create our finite element model. So what we're going to do is we're going to create points and join up those points by lines and eventually we're going to turn those lines into the truss elements. So we're going to start off by creating key points. So we click on create, key points, and we're going to do it in the active coordinate system. So we're, we're in the X, Y coordinate system here by default. So in the active coordinate system. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do that asks you for a key point number. If you want, you can fill that in, or if not, ANSYS will generate the numbers automatically for you. So the first thing we want to do is create a key point at the x equal to 0 and y equal to 0 point, and this is going to be the left-hand edge of our truss structure. And I click on Apply, and you can't really see it there, but a key point has turned up just there at the origin. So the next key point then, um, just moving across the base of the bridge, is going to be, um, has an X coordinate of 2 and a Y coordinate of 0. So I click apply and you can see a second key point has, has turned up. Um, I'm just going to keep on going with the rest of them. So we have another key point at 4 comma 0. We have another one at uh, 6 comma 0. We have another one at uh, 8 comma 0. And we have another one at 10 comma 0. So that's 10 meters from the right hand side is the final one. So that is the right-hand side of the bridge, and this is the left-hand side of the bridge, of the base of the bridge. So now we need to make some of the other key points that define the other points of the, in the bridge. Um, so the first one um, at the top of the bridge has an x-coordinate of 2, and it's at the top of the bridge, which is the bridge is a height of 4 meters, so it's 2 and 4. So if I just move this out of the way, you can see that uh, a new key point has just appeared here. And again, let's just go and fill all the other ones in there. The next key point has a coordinate of 4, 4. Then we have one at 6, 4. And finally, we have one at 8, 4. And since this is the last one, instead of clicking Apply, because we are now finished with the box, we can click OK, which will generate that key point and then exit us out of the Create Key Points uh, dialog box. So now we have uh, 10 key points, which define the main points um, on the bridge. And we can now join these key points up with lines uh, to create the um, geometry of the bridge. So we close down the key point sum menu and open up the line sub menu. You click on lines, go on straight line, and we get this uh, box down here. So it basically, um, this box allows us to pick two points which from which a line will be generated. And it, again, if you're ever unsure what a box is off asking you an answer, so if you just go down to the bottom here, down to this little um, section in the bottom left hand corner, you can see it's saying pick or enter the end key points of a line. Okay, so let's let's do the first line. I'm going to keep key point number one and key point number seven. So I've created that line. Um, and again, I'll just keep on going and create the various key points. Again, if you're unsure what I'm doing here, you know, you need to take a look at the, the figure in the book, um, figure for case study A showing the geometry of the problem. So it doesn't really matter too much which way you join these up, as long as you end up with the, the same geometry that's actually in the book. Okay, so if you look um, at that figure, you'll, you'll get an idea for what I'm doing here at the moment. Okay, and then the final one is that. Okay, so that, if you compare that to the figure in the book, you'll see that we've we've more or less created the same geometry. Okay, so we can click OK, because we're finished with that. So now I have uh, lines joining up all the key points. 